Okay, Dr. Guy. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the sixth session of the lecture series. I am Dr. Levis Guy, and I would like to introduce uh, Mr. John Arnold, who would be introducing our lecturer today. I would also like to thank the Embassy of the Kingdom of the Netherlands in Port of Spain for affording us the opportunity to do this lecture in conjunction with the National Trust of Trinidad and Tobago and the Tobago Library Services. Mr. John Arnold is the chairman of Music Trinidad and Tobago. He's also the CEO of the Tobago Festivals Commission Limited. Mr. Arnold is also a commissioner at the Equal Opportunities Commission and a musical director of the illustrious Signal Hill Alumni Choir. Mr. Arnold, good morning. You're on mute, Mr. Arnold, you're on mute. My humble apologies. Thank you very much, Dr. Guy. And uh, let me also say welcome to uh, Professor William Kulusta and the National Trust, um, Ashley Morris and all the others. Um, for me, today is a joy um, because all of what we are talking about, the, the salute to what I call the, the, the Dutch um, presence in Tobago, I think is um, one of those things I've been working well in the background with Dr. Guy and supporting her work with the Rockley Bay Project. And I'm really, really glad that these series occurred at this time in our history. And I hope that somehow we can get that project back on. But today we are happy to have uh, Willem Kluster. He's a professor and Robert and Virginia Scotland Endowed Chair in History and International Relations at Clark University. He has published widely on the Dutch Atlantic, contraband trade, and the age of revolutions. Some of his publications include American Independence Movements, A History in Documents, The Atlantic World, Essays on Slavery, Migration, and Imagination, Rem Between Empires, the Second Dutch Atlantic, 1680 to 1815. And then Revolutions in the Atlantic World, a Comparative History. All these are some of the publications from our esteemed uh, professor, and we are happy to have him here today. So let's welcome and uh, welcome Professor Willem Kluster at this time. Thank you very much um, for that nice introduction. And let me go to the PowerPoint. Um, is it visible? Yes, it is visible. OK, very good. Then I can begin. When Dutch individuals started entering the Atlantic world in the late 16th century, they were moving into a realm that was still largely controlled by Spain and Portugal, the two neighbors that were united under one crown between 1580 and 1640. The Dutch challenged their Iberian foes as both privateers and smugglers. By the year 1600, Dutch privateering had become a major Atlantic pursuit and the West Indies a theater of war, where after 1621, the newly founded West India Company fought the hereditary enemy by fire and sword. The opening of the Atlantic front, it was expected, would bring the war at home to a happy conclusion. The company embarked on an overly ambitious program that was labeled the Grand Design. The prominent feature of this Grand Design was the invasion of Brazil, seen as a weak yet profitable link in the Habsburg imperial edifice. But the Dutch now entered the Caribbean also in great force. Throughout the 17th century, the Caribbean was a major site of Dutch naval and landborne warfare, first with Spain, then England, and finally France. In an attempt to free their country from what was viewed as the Dutch commercial 
maritime stranglehold, the French ousted the Dutch from various colonies, including, of course, Tobago. For all practical purposes, the Caribbean defeats at the hands of the French in the 1670s ended Dutch expansion in the Atlantic world. Subsequently, the Dutch Atlantic would be devoid of conquests and offensive wars. My focus in today's lecture will be on these six islands. I think you cannot really see the ones to the right, but let me uh, start with these three just off the coast of Venezuela. As you can see, Curacao, the main one for our purposes in the 17th and 18th century, flanked by Aruba and Bonaire. And then more to the north in the Caribbean, we see St. Eustatius and right to the north of St. Eustatius, the very tiny island of Saba, and to the north of Saba, St. Martin, which is, as you probably know, an island still shared by the French and um, the Dutch. So it's these six islands that I will talk about today. I will not talk about Suriname on the mainland, but simply focus on the six islands that um, were Dutch starting in the 17th century. Initially, the Dutch did not focus on trade in the colonies they established um, in St. Martin, Curaçao, and St. Eustatius. Salt collecting was the rationale for the settlement of St. Martin in 1631. Food production occupied the first non-military residence of Dutch Curaçao, and tobacco cultivation lured the initial Dutch settlers of St. Eustatius in the 1630s. Gradually, however, these islands came to revolve around trade. Agricultural pursuits were not completely sidelined. However, St. Eustatius was home to 76 plantations in 1775. St. Martin boasted no fewer than 92 plantations by 1789. And Curaçao reportedly already had 111 plantations before 1700. But these plantations produced foodstuffs such as maize, or they raised cattle, and many ended up combining these two activities. Cash crop production failed on Curaçao, despite repeated attempts, but fared better in the other Dutch, uh, the other two colonies, especially St. Martin, where 35 of the 92 plantations were sugar estates. Even in the best years, however, was minor compared to the Dutch Guyana colony of Suriname and non-Dutch producers of sugar in the Caribbean. What did make the Dutch island special and particularly Curaçao and St. Eustatius, was their function as regional entrepôts based for a good part on smuggling. Traders in Curaçao shipped the European manufactures they obtained from the Dutch Republic to the Spanish mainland and other parts of the Spanish Caribbean, as well as to the French islands. Merchants in St. Eustatius and on a much smaller scale those in St. Martin also made good use of their location by establishing commercial bridges to nearby British and French islands, as well as to British North America. Apart from merchants involved in these long distance imports and exports, a large part of the free and enslaved population of the Dutch colonies were to some degree involved in trade. Commercial booms and busts therefore had a direct impact on local prosperity. Of the six, Dutch islands, only Curaçao and later St. Eustatius had a substantial population. And the population densities were well above regional standards. The only reliable census for Curaçao prior to 1800 dates from the year 1789. In that year, the island had around 21,000 inhabitants, just over half of whom lived in the city of Willemstad, which you see on this slide, which was the only genuine city in the insular Dutch Caribbean. The proportion of slaves in Curaçao was just over 60%. That of the Protestants was 12, the Jews five, and the free non-white population made up 18% in that year of 1789. The prominent share of the European segment, compared to most other Caribbean islands, reflected the mercantile character of the island. The colonists' European origins were diverse. Protestants formed the great majority among the owners of agrarian mansions and farms, but Protestants and Jews alike participated heavily in all trades connecting the island to the wider Atlantic. Protestantism was also dominant among the soldiers stationed on the island, who were bracketed together with the so-called poor slaves by one resident physician as the most despised section of the colony's population. 
despised, that is, of course, by the whites. Many of them must have fallen victim to yellow fever or smallpox. Throughout the early modern period, the proportion of Jewish settlers was remarkably high in Suriname, as in Suriname, and also later in St. Eustatius. If the percentage of Curacao's residents who were white was unusual by Caribbean standards, the relative size of its enslaved population was rather large for a new world society that was not based on cash crop production. The number of slaves has been estimated as hovering between eight and 13,000 in the 18th century, and the exact number available is that of almost 13,000, 12,864 in 1789. 321 enslaved Africans were counted on Bonaire and 78 on Aruba. Africans arrived in large numbers on Curacao during the heyday of the island's transit trade and slaves to the nearby Spanish colonies, which effectively ended by 1730. The subsequent population growth must have been largely due to natural increase. Another conspicuous demographic feature of Curacao was the early development of a considerable community of free people of African and Euro-African origins, which set the island apart from all other Dutch colonies. By the late 18th century, half of the island's free population was non-white. This community was indispensable to the emergence of the island as a commercial hub. While the majority may have worked in modest occupations ranging from shipmate to dock worker, there are numerous indications of free Curacao's of African or mixed descent, both men and women, owning ships or conducting extensive trade in the region. In sum, therefore, Curacao's role as a commercial center in the region was the work of a heterogeneous population in which Dutch Protestants formed what but one element. That both Protestant and Jewish merchants were involved in trade with the Dutch Republic has long been known, even if, if it remains to be seen whether they were really distinct Gentile and Jewish trade networks. The fact that a much broader group participated in regional trade indicates that Dutch agency, the Dutch role in the wider Caribbean and the wider Atlantic world, should be understood as a cross-cultural endeavor on all sides. Let me go to the next slide. Unlike Curacao, St. Eustatius experienced considerable demographic growth only a century after it was colonized. An all-time high of 8,123 was reached in 1789. Throughout the 17th and 18th centuries, slaves made up between 60 and 75 percent of the population. The growth spur, the economic growth spur, beginning in the 70s, 30s was connected to developments in the British Atlantic. The proclamation of the Molasses Act in 1730 led to the settlement of agents acting for North American merchant firms in St. Eustatius, where they could minimize the effects of British mercantilism. The island's white community also grew as some members of both Curacao's and Suriname Jewish communities moved there, intending to build the equivalent of Curacao in the Northern Caribbean, but their numbers always remained modest. In the 1760s and 70s, the European merchant community was among the most cosmopolitan in the Americas, with Protestant Dutch settlers, a minority group, and English as the prevailing language in St. Eustatius and St. Martin and in Saba. This vibrant community connected the islands to the Dutch Republic in West Africa via, via long distance trade and even more intensely to British North America via trade through surrounding islands, particularly the French Caribbean. Locally established merchants, sensitive and usually illegal relations with a wide range of port cities. As a contemporary put it, the policy of giving the greatest possible accommodation to all strangers of whatever nation had not only made St. Eustatius a quote, universal repository for the produce and manufactures of every quarter of the globe, but also made it its merchant community truly cosmopolitan. The centrality of trade made for a different type of elite in the islands than in the typical plantation colonies of the Caribbean. If planters and administrators were on top of the social hierarchy, for instance, in Dutch Suriname, merchants were held in the highest regard in Curacao and St. Eustatius. On both islands, people from all walks of life were involved in commerce, and most of which was illicit. A good part of the island's trade was conducted by less well-off people who bought a sloop from credit and could not afford to pay it off until the sloop returned. Investing all their fluid assets in a single voyage 
such ship owners were usually not men of substance, but rather part-time traders and sailors who formed a significant part of Curacao's population. These men supplemented their monthly wages by engaging in petty trade. They carried small amounts of merchandise on their Caribbean trading voyages, risking total loss in case of confiscation of these contraband commodities by foreign authorities. An increasing number of those involved in Curacao's trade were people of African or mixed descent. The St. Eustatius, by contrast, where their share of the total free population was small, there is no indication that non-whites acted as ship owners and merchants. Mobility in the Dutch Antilles was the highest among the enslaved Africans. Of course, the major factor in this mobility was the nearly immediate re-export upon arrival in the free ports of Curacao and St. Eustatius to the surrounding Caribbean islands and the Spanish main. After a brief stay on one of the two islands, these slaves were moved to other nations' colonies and, in a sense, disappeared from the Dutch Atlantic, mostly without leaving a trace. Much smaller numbers of Curacao slaves left cultural traces in other parts of the region as they fled Curacao's slave regime. Maritime marronage, maritime running away, led to the formation of a free black community in the Coro region of what is today Venezuela. Likewise, both free and enslaved men from the island of Curacao, some African, some Creole, some black and some of mixed origins, traveled as sailors of various Caribbean trade routes and inevitably served as messengers as well. These sailors were instrumental in passing the news, for instance, of the Haitian Revolution onto other colonies. Large numbers of slaves disappeared from Curacao during the revolutionary decades at the end of the 18th and in the early 19th century. The island's total population shrank by one third to only 14,000 in 1816. The number of slaves was halved in that period. Some of this decline reflected the migration slave owners, bringing their chattel to the Northern Caribbean, particularly Danish St. Thomas. Something of the same sort must have happened in St. Eustatius. Its development as a free trade port for the Northern Caribbean had involved the immigration of merchants from Curacao, who most likely took their personal slaves with them. The sack of the island of St. Eustatius in 1781 by the British and its definitive decline by 1800 triggered two waves of emigration with the adjacent competing free port of St. Thomas as the major destination. Enslaved blacks worked in the Dutch Caribbean from the earliest days of colonization. In Aruba, Bonaire and Saba, the proportion of the enslaved of the overall in itself tiny population was relatively small, most between one third and one half. Aruba and Bonaire remained poor, poorly populated, mainly functioning as pasture for Curacao and employing a modest number of local mestizo farmers and enslaved Africans, the latter also working the scorching salt pans of Bonaire. Labor in the salt pans was likewise one of the jobs allotted to slaves on the Dutch side of St. Martin, in addition to agrarian work on a few, planta on a few plantations producing sugar or crops for local consumption. St. Martin's slaves outnumbered the white population throughout the documented period in the 17th and 18th centuries. By 1790, three quarters of the colony's inhabitants were slaves, while the number of free people of color was uh, not even 200. Much the same applies to St. Eustatius, where the share of slaves was some 60% for much of the 18th century, whereas the number of free non-whites remained small. Of course, none of these islands fit the mold of anything typically Caribbean, as long as we take the plantation colony as a model. In comparison to the French and English Caribbean, the societies that developed in the insular Dutch Caribbean evolved along a different trajectory in which slave labor still mattered, but was put to other uses and exploited in other ways. The agrarian branch of the economies of the Dutch West Indies has attracted much less attention than the maritime branch, probably for being less spectacular and seemingly less important. And yet, Without local food production, the commercial growth of the port cities would not have been possible. Additionally, much of the slave labor in both islands was not deployed in urban commercial setting, but rather in agriculture, catering to the local population. Well, St. Eustatius, the enslaved population must have been put to work both for agrarian purposes and around the warehouses. In all types of work relating to the loading and unloading of ships, they worked together with the sailors manning the boats. 
most of these free men, free men of many shades of color. The economic history of Curacao is much better documented than that of St. Eustatius, and hence the contours of slave labor and the wider labor market, as well as the characteristics of the local regime of slavery are better known. Half of Curacao slaves were tied up in agrarian work, producing food that was indispensable for the growth and survival of the maritime sector that has attracted so much attention. It is likely that there was a considerable distance between the two groups of slaves, and even more so between agrarian slaves and the urban free non-white community. That conclusion can at least be drawn from the major slave revolt of 1795, which apparently attracted mainly agrarian slaves that was suppressed not only by white colonials, but also by the mixed race militia. In 1789, more than half of Curacao's enslaved population lived and worked in the countryside. Not much is known about this rural community. They were working on a type of plantations uncommon in the Caribbean, sometimes likened to continental hacendas, producing food for local consumption only. A typical Curacao mansion, usually home to a white owner of Dutch Protestant origin, was small sized and employing between a few dozen to a rare maximum of perhaps 100 slaves who worked a limited surface of mostly arid land. The ecological conditions were far less favorable than in most of the Caribbean, allowing only for low productive agricultural and some cattle breeding. The work of the agrarian slaves was atypical by Caribbean standards and heavily marked by the recurring problems of drought. Even if the majority of local slaves were employed in agriculture, local production was not enough to feed the islands, making food imports from New York, Philadelphia, and Rhode Island, as well as Venezuela, and to a lesser degree, the Dutch Republic, indispensable. More is known about urban and maritime slavery because most archives pertaining to Curacao resulted from Willemstad, the port cities, function as a hub in a network of Atlantic connections. Scholarly studies have revealed several features. First, we see enslaved Africans and their Curacao descendants working in a wide range of occupations, often alongside free laborers of all shapes. Next, historians have documented that these occupations implied frequent contacts with other parts of the Caribbean. Third, there is ample evidence of high manumission rates and anecdotal evidence of social ascent of Curacao's of African origins. Finally, and more implicitly, studies of urban slavery in Willemstad raise the question of the extent to which rural and urban slaves were inhabiting the same colonial space. Slaves were working in urban settings in Willemstad's buzzing harbor and on ships, and the labor was possibly put to several such uses at the same time. Most important among the jobs in the city was domestic service, predominantly reserved for women. Labor in and around the harbor was allotted mainly to men, to men who were employed in the warehouses in loading and unloading ships and ship repairs and so on. Maritime slave labor was again a male affair with slaves serving as sailors. Fishing for local consumption was most likely primarily an occupation for free people. So in all, these, in all of these occupations, enslaved laborers were working with free men and women, both white and non-white, often performing the same tasks. The lines between free and enslaved in this highly monetized urban economy were comparatively thin, at times even enabling slaves to pass for free when it suited them. The slave people based in the city could make money in several ways. Their owners, both the West India Company and private individuals, would hire their slaves out to third parties, allowing them to keep a modest proportion of the net benefit for themselves. Perhaps more important, slaves could engage in small entrepreneurial ventures on the side while working for their owners. Thus, an enslaved sailor traveling between Curacao and San Domingue could engage in illicit petty trading and a seamstress hired out to do a work could arrange to have some side jobs herself. Even if rural slaves were less isolated than slaves on, on Guyana plantations, they did spend most of their time on the farm with limited contact with city people and probably even less with the international clientele of Curacao. Urban slaves, by contrast, were constantly in contact with foreigners, if not professionally, then at least casually, as all share the same spaces in the city quarters. And slave sailors employed in Curacao vessels had even more opportunities for international contacts as their masters' commercial pursuits would bring them to a range of port cities in the Caribbean, 
the Spanish Main and North America, where they have, must have made some contact with the local population. Slaves ran away since the early days of black slavery. In the early 18th century, some slaves even sailed with ocean going ships to the Dutch Republic, hoping to reach the shores of freedom, but nearly all of them seem to have been sent back to new world slavery. And slave Curacao has also profited from a ransoming expedition by the French in 1713, when a large number ran away to the French ships where they found a place to hide. More commonly, Baronage took the form of maritime escape. The best chance for Curacao's runaway slaves was to canoe or to sail to Venezuela, a risky but navigable 40 miles away. Baronage may have functioned as a safety valve for the slave system, but outright revolts also occurred in Curacao on at least four occasions in 1716, 1750, 1774, and 1795. The first of these recorded rebellions saw 11 Africans who had arrived on the island only seven months before kill three whites on a West Indian Company plantation. Facing opposition from fellow slaves, they failed to implement the plan to start a general revolt, and their attempt came to naught. Around 100 Africans from Willemstad and its surrounding area were involved in the next revolt in 1750. Their target was a government plantation, and their victims were one white overseer and 59 enslaved blacks. The fear that this uprising instilled among the Harsh punishments. 39 rebels were executed and 13 were exiled. The outburst of 1774 was a mixture of rebellion and maronage. All 72 slaves belonging to one plantation had rebelled um, and boarded a, a large canoe heading for Venezuela. After they were discovered, most took to the woods, after which they were apprehended one by one. No executions followed these events. But by far the most important revolt is the one of 1795, started on August 17th with an apparent protest against an infringement on the usual daily routines. But this revolt soon turned into an attempt to launch an island-wide revolution inspired by the Haitian Revolution that had started just four years before. Within two days, some 2,000 of the island's 12,000 slaves were in revolt. These rebels won the first battles, but then the tide started to turn. Negotiations were started in late August when one of the leaders, who named himself Toussaint, affirmed in the French language, we are here to win or die. In the end, the combined white collared and black militias prevailed and the leaders of the revolt uh, were executed in what authorities called an exemplary, extraordinarily cruel manner. Contemporary accounts left dramatic testimonies of the revolt's foremost leader, Tula, who may have been born outside of Curacao and most likely had spent time in the French Caribbean. He was reportedly well abreast of the French and Haitian revolutions. He said, we have been badly treated for too long. We do not want to do anybody harm, but we seek our freedom. The French, that means the, the French Caribbean, blacks have been given their freedom. Holland has been taken over by the French. So we must be free too. And then drawing on Christian rhetoric, Tula argued that all people share the same parents, Adam and Eve, and therefore all are entitled to the same liberty. Three non-white people in Curacao, I've mentioned it, were no, more numerous than whites uh, by the late 18th century. The numbers were almost equal, but the number of whites begins to decline by then. By contrast, the number of whites in St. Eustatius and St. Martin still exceeded free non-whites by wide margins by the late 18th century. Commensurate with their growing demographic weight, free blacks and free coloreds occupied an increasingly significant place in the economic life of the Dutch Caribbean, as we have seen. There is some evidence of both men and women uh, of African descent attaining considerable property and status reflected, among other things, in their slave ownership. The trade with the coast of Venezuela allowed one free black ship captain, supercargo and ship owner named Antonio Beltran to buy a house in the Otrabamboud and to own 10 slaves by 1748. For three years, he also owned a plantation. The porch of his house served as a guardhouse for the free black militia of which he was 
the capital. In that capacity, he actually helped to defeat the 1750 slave revolt. His military service was not exceptional. Freedmen on Curacao had been assigned a military role since the early 18th century. Starting during the War of the Spanish Succession, free black and free colored men, as well as enslaved Africans, were enrolled in the island's militia companies, both to defend the island against foreign intruders and to maintain public order. One of the militia's tasks was to hunt down runaway slaves, which would sometimes take the form of a two week expedition. Racist ordinances circumscribed the freedoms of Curacao's free and enslaved blacks. Playing loud music was forbidden, as was carrying a stick or walking in the street after dark. Any white person was allowed to punish non-white behavior considered impertinent with a cane. Besides, the legal testimony of black or colored witnesses lacked judicial force. Specific legislation discriminating against free non-whites did not exist with one important exception. After complaints from less affluent whites, legislation was introduced in 1749, prohibiting blacks and colored men from keeping a shop in town. Still, poverty affected not only those of African descent. It came and went among all ethnic groups of Curacao, whose commercial economy was more vulnerable to economic downturns, and besides produced insufficient foodstuffs in itself. Lack of provision sometimes made Aruba's Amerindian population relocate to Venezuela, only to return to the island when the food was plentiful again. Even those among them who were in the company service, the West Indian company service, were poorly endowed, receiving no more than a little corn and at times animal bones instead of meat. Food scarcity affected the white population as well. The poorest segment of white society was made up of sailors whose families in times of commercial slumps could lose their life. How am I doing on time? Am I, uh, I think I've spoken for half an hour. I think, uh, no, you're doing enough. well, you can continue. Okay, very good. After 1730, the demographic growth of Curious South African and ethnically mixed population depended, as I've mentioned, on natural reproduction, not on slave imports. This in turn means first that the influx of African culture became minimal at a relatively early stage, and second that interracial sexual relations early on caused the emergence of an ever-growing intermediate group. Moreover, European immigration seems to have been modest, while both the Protestant and the Jewish communities were well established at an early stage. Metropolitan influence was therefore limited and did not block the emergence of a relatively stable Creole culture nurtured more by the island's regional connections than by its links to a faraway metropole. These regional connections marked not only the European population, but also the urban and to a lesser extent rural population at large, whether slave or free. The emergence of a Creole culture in Curacao was a process therefore affecting the entire population. The most conspicuous form of Creole culture in all three leeward islands of the continental coast, so the ones close to Venezuela, was the Papiamentu language, which emerged in an as yet undefined moment in the early colonial era, possibly already in the 17th century, and with significant pre-Middle Passage Afro-Portuguese impact. By 1747, sailors on board a Curacao vessel that was taken by a British pro privateer told a judge that people in Curacao commonly spoke Popimento. By the end of the century, Papimento was clearly the island's first language, uh, as it was, one assumes, on Aruba and Bonaire. Papiamento was not a Dutch-based Creole, but rather a language with an African syntax and a predominantly Iberian and particularly Portuguese vocabulary, echoing the early recruitment of enslaved Africans in Portuguese Africa, the Portuguese spoken by the local Jewish population and the intense commercial context with the Spanish main. Whereas Creolized variants of European languages throughout the Caribbean tended to wear the stain of lower class inferiority, Papiamento, gradually acquired a more prestigious petition, position. By the late 18th century, Papiamento had become the lingua franca for all inhabitants, irrespective of class, color, or legal status. The indigenous, the Amerindian contribution to the process of creolization was of limited significance. 
And that's not surprising given their early decimation on the islands. In the late 18th century, report estimated that only three or four Amerindians were living on Curacao. Their number was higher, but still limited on Aruba and Bonaire. While well, the Spanish environment, the Spanish American environment, affected Curacao, Bonaire, and Aruba linguistically, in the Northern Caribbean Dutch islands, the English language became dominant at an early stage under the influence of the island's Anglophone environment and the many English settlers with temporary jobs. During the Anglo French War in 1744, a French privateer mistook a ship from St. Martin for an enemy English vessel. After all, the crew knew no Dutch, nor did the ship's owner, uh, despite being born in the colony. In that same colony, a newly arriving minister of the Reformed Church discovered in 1763 that none of the churchgoers understood his Dutch. A contemporary Dutch observer wrote that the lifestyle of St. Eustatius inhabitants was so perfectly English in morals, manners, clothing, and interior design that only a flag was lacking in the island completely English. In the Dutch Republic, the Reformed Church was the so-called public church, the official spiritual organ of society, but not the only established church. Membership was not required by law. Buttressed by the West India Company, which appointed ministers and made sure that it, its overseas servants were church members, the Reformed Church also took root as the public church, but not without difficulties. One obstacle was the need to accommodate large sections of the white colonial populations, who were not Calvinists. The borders of this reformed Atlantic uh, did not coincide with those of the Dutch colonial realm because ethnic Dutchmen in the Danish islands attended services there at the Dutch reformed church. In most colonies ruled by the Dutch Republic, the reformed church was dominant in the leading circles. Another common feature was the initial ban on Lutheranism that was maintained well into the 18th century. Like in the Dutch Republic, Catholics were deprived of religious rights beyond the freedom of conscience, except in Curacao, where they lived a full Catholic life. It was the inter-imperial context that overrode the traditional Dutch animosity vis-a-vis -vis Catholicism. Priests from the nearby Spanish Main arrived regularly in Curacao to baptize and sermonize among the enslaved islanders. Catholicism thus became an important ingredient of afro curacao culture. For St. Eustatius, it was Methodism that began to spread around the time of the American Revolution. Although the religion was banned from other Dutch colonies around 1800, it was allowed to flourish in St. Eustatius. Jews, meanwhile, were granted extensive privileges in Suriname, Curacao, and St. Eustatius, and established crucially important communities there, the largest Jewish communities in the Americas. Although religion, enabled the white community to get together at least once a week, encouraging sociability, reformed services were poorly attended in most colonies. St. Martin's minister complained in 1763 that he had an audience of only four or five people. The reason he added was that the church was half an hour's walk from the town of Philipsburg and no Dutchman owned a horse. Where Dutch ministers were active, they preached not only to Dutch natives, but also to Germans, many of whom were soldiers and almost all of them were Lutherans. On St. Eustatius, the Methodist Church began its successful mission in the 1780s. Inspired by the visit of Thomas Coke, the first Methodist, Methodist bishop, and the evangelical work of a man named Black Harry, a former slave who hailed from the United States, Methodism grew by leaps and bounds in St. Eustatius, in spite of government persecution. By the time it was recognized and a chapel was built in 1804, many residents of St. Eustatius, both free and enslaved, had joined it. No such Protestant missionary movements were allowed in Curacao, whose free colored Professor Kluster, are you there? 
All right. Um, everyone, could you give us a couple of seconds to see if we get them back? Um, I think he is connection dropped. Give us a couple of seconds, please. Thank you. Hi, while we wait till we get, uh, I think he's coming back in. Good. A reminder, just put your questions in the chat as well, please, um, if you have any questions so far. I think he's coming back in now. Sorry for that. Yes, I think we have you back there, Professor. Okay, my apologies. I don't know uh, what happened. I think the, the Wi Fi gave up mm -hmm. uh, where I am here. Um, so I'm continuing where I left off, I hope. Um, so um, let me continue with the completion of one big church, uh, the St. Anna Church in 1768, built largely with construction material illegally imported from the Spanish main. The church accommodated no less than 3,000 people when the new Dominican priest arrived in 1774. One prevalent notion was that Catholics were a potential fifth column, which echoed concerns in the Dutch Republic. And yet Catholicism continued to flourish on Curacao. How can we explain that? The Reformed Church had never seriously missionized among people of African descent, explaining Catholic conversion rates on Curacao by reference to the alleged superficial nature of Catholic missions and the supposed inclination of black people to Catholicism. The rationale for this tolerant policy was the authorities' conviction that Catholic priests managed to, quote, keep the blacks in check, an achievement that could not be expected from Protestant peach preaches, as one governor put it. The Jewish leaders followed the same line of thought. They belonged to the only non-Christian population group that enjoyed religious freedom in Dutch America throughout the late, long 18th century. Members of different religious communities interacted with other groups on a daily basis. As in the Dutch Republic, their coexistence involved what one historian has called an ecumenicism of everyday relations, partly spontaneous and partly based on enforced toleration. In the insular Caribbean, this acumen was reinforced by race relations. The rule by a white minority over an enslaved black majority spawned a pragmatic solidarity among the Europeans that would otherwise have been much less pronounced. This solidarity translated into the habitual acceptance of everyday violence vis-a-vis -vis slaves and the subordination of free non-whites. By all standards, Curacao and San Eustatius were the chief Dutch colonies in the insular Caribbean, eclipsing the other ones both demographically and economically, although St. Martin was not insignificant in either respect. The international trade networks of which they were an integral, integral part largely bypassed the sparsely populated islands of Saba, Monoba. Another distinguishing feature of the entrepôts of St. Eustatius and Curacao was their slave majority, as I've mentioned. The slave trade marked the development of Curacao ever since the 1660s. And after its participation in the regional slave trade steeply declined after 1730, the island's black population reproduced naturally. Not all people of African birth or descent were tied to the mercantile economy, since most of them worked on plantations producing provisions for the home market. Without new cultural influences, from Africa after 1730, black Curacao's embraced Catholicism, though certainly in a local variant with African influences. Their conversion was also testimony to the island's close relationship with the Spanish main, from which many priests arrived to administer to the population. Similarly, the close ties to nearby British islands enabled Methodism to flourish in St. Eustatius. 
Allowing Catholicism on Curacao was a pragmatic decision by the Dutch authorities. Economically indispensable and demographically strong, Jews were also granted religious freedoms, but otherwise religious heterogeneity was anathema, in part because of the need for the white elite to remain united. The Reformed Church, therefore, enjoyed a privileged position, at least until the mid-18th century, when its role declined all over the Dutch Caribbean. Church attendance dwindled, and Lutheran groups and Curacao and senior stations received the liberties they requested. The recurrent attempt by anti-Semitic Christians to have Jewish freedoms withdrawn also seemed to have faded in the latter part of the century. Racial tensions expressed in the number of slave revolts that rocked Curacao served to mitigate strife between whites, allowing for government-sanctioned religious openness. Both religious exclusivity and diversity were thus informed by the dominant white fear of black insurrections. So the Dutch West Indies, and this is my little conclusion, thus underwent the same transformation that has been observed for the Caribbean in general, where the foundation of European identities changed from religion to race. The case of the Dutch islands shows that this transformation did not require a typical plantation setting. Thank you very much. Yes, thank you so much, Professor Kuster, for your presentation. Um, very interesting presentation. Uh, I could see some, um, I have a lot of questions regarding the um, comparison between the Dutch um, West Indies and the British West Indies and many of the topics that you, you discussed this morning. Um, but we will begin with the first question we had. Um, someone would like to, like for you to expand on the salt industry, explain more on the salt industry because you, you, you mentioned it in your presentation. Okay. Salt was uh, one factor in Dutch expansion in the Atlantic world. Um, the uh, successive Spanish kings prohibited Dutch ships to continue doing what they had been doing in the 16th century, that is to come to Spain and especially to the southern parts of Portugal, uh, to the town of Chetubal, where the Dutch had always uh, uh, come back from with large loads of salt. Uh, so in the course of the war with the Dutch, the Spanish kings prohibited uh, the entrance of Dutch ships to the Iberian Peninsula. And as a consequence, Dutch ships started looking for other repositories of salt in the Atlantic world. Uh, the Portuguese islands, they uh, went to St. Martin, they went to Curaçao thinking that, that was also a major site where salt could be loaded. They, for a while, in the very end of the 16th century, the first years of the 17th century, uh, went to a peninsula of Venezuela, the Araya Peninsula. And for six years, they loaded a tremendous amount of salt, uh, all during the war with Spain. And then in 1605, Spanish authorities intervened and um, uh, basically allowed them not to come back again for a long time. And then once the peace treaty is signed between the Dutch and uh, Spain in 1648, the Dutch are very eager to come back to that peninsula, but the Spanish authorities don't allow them to do that. Okay. Um, on salt, again, just briefly, um, in, in a visit, in a personal visit to San Martin, I, I had the opportunity to see some of these, um, this enterprise taking place, salt, extracting salt, um, and so forth. Are there any other islands in the Dutch Caribbean that still um, produce salt or, or work in salt? Yes, the, uh, uh, the image I showed before of Bonaire is an image of today, of, of just a few years ago. So these, these large salt pyramids are still one of the uh, economic pursuits in Bonaire to this very day. So that's a very old tradition. Um, the Dutch um, in the course of their expansion into the Caribbean, which coincided with the War of Independence, uh, 
uh, seas occupy a number of islands uh, for which it's not immediately clear what their economic rationale is. Uh, but for Bonaire, I think from very early on, the idea was this is going to be an island that we can load salt, which is a terrible line of business to be in. It's not very healthy, uh, especially in those days. Uh, so the Dutch themselves, when they around 1600, uh, they make sure that they only uh, do the business of salt loading very early in the morning when the sun is just up or uh, very late in the day, not during uh, the, the warmer hours of the day. Okay. Very interesting. Okay, we have another question here. Um, it's about trade. Since it appears that the Dutch were very interested in trade, why did they hold on to the islands after their position in world in world trade wing? So how why did they hold on to these uh, islands like Curacao and so forth? Why not? That's a very good question. Uh, I would have liked to be part of the board meetings where this question was discussed. I, I think one reason might not seem immediately uh, to make sense, but one reason may be uh, precisely because they were so insignificant that they never bothered to uh, do something about it. Uh, because if they're so insignificant, who wants to buy them? Because that would have been the option, just like uh, Denmark sold St. Thomas and, and St. John and St. Croix to the United States in 1917, at least there was a buyer uh, that remains to be seen for, for these um, Dutch islands. Uh, it's not, not, of course, that the islands were completely insignificant in the 19th century, but compared to the heyday when Curacao was really one of the largest ports by the early 18th century, it's one of the largest port cities in terms of its uh, imports and exports, there was not much going on anymore uh, by, the, by the 19th century. And, you might say that the uh, the weight of uh, Dutch America is shifted quite significantly in that period to Suriname. So um, why did they hold on to the islands after their position in world trade waned? Um, it may well be because the islands had become so insignificant that it, it was hard to get rid of them. Very interesting weird, um, perspective of it. Um, okay, I have a question from Professor Brereton. Some of the Dutch expelled from Brazil in the 1650s played a big role in early sugar industry in, in English and French colonies. Can you speak about this? Can you um, elaborate about this? Yes. Um, this and why is did they take enslaved people? And, and did they take any enslaved people with them? Sorry. Yeah, you know. Um... So the, the end of Dutch Brazil comes slowly. It begins with a, a revolt against Dutch rule in 1645. And it finally ends in 1654, nine years later, when the Dutch surrender their remaining holdings in Brazil. Uh, in the meantime, already uh, had uh, sugar technology been introduced in Barbados, which is often considered to have been uh, the island where the so-called sugar revolution starts and because it's hard to uh, to solve the puzzle of all the pieces that uh, have to be in place when it comes to starting the sugar revolution the dutch have often been uh, credited or credited between quotation marks with uh, being quite instrumental in starting uh, the sugar revolution in barbados it is clear that the Dutch traded there. I'm actually quite not, right now. I'm working in the Amsterdam notarial archives, and you do come across quite a number of uh, Dutch ships sailing to Barbados. Uh, did they take enslaved people with them? They did, but not to Barbados. I would say the Dutch impact on the rise of the sugar industry. That case can be made much easier for the French islands, for Martinique in particular, but also Guadeloupe. What happened in 1654? It, it's really uh, quite coincidental. I think we have to imagine an exodus of people from Brazil. They, they were given three months to wrap up their businesses, but many people are afraid that the Portuguese will not keep their part of the bargain and, and they sail away as soon as possible. And of course, there were many slave owners among them and they tried to bring as many slaves with them. What we know is that these people arrived in Martinique and Guadeloupe with their 
uh, enslaved workers, probably not the same number that they had had back in Brazil. And we know at the same time that there are sugar planters among them. Uh, and not just sugar planters, also people with links to uh, the sugar refiners in Amsterdam. And Amsterdam was the largest sugar refining city in the world back then. So we know that one man had a brother who had a sugar refinery in Amsterdam, other, others knew other sugar refiners. So that is uh, important as well. Also important, I would say, and that's where the last part of this question comes in, uh, in the 1660s, coming out of this decade of the 1650s, the Dutch virtually monopolized the slave trade to the French islands. And of course, slavery is a very important ingredient in this whole sugar revolution uh, to, to have the, the, the manpower to uh, do this terrible, terrible uh, line of business was crucial. And the Dutch had developed their own slave trade to Brazil before uh, the Dutch colonization of Brazil. There are virtually no Dutch slave ships. By now, the Dutch uh, have contacts in Africa, have expertise of sailing uh, across the Middle Passage, et cetera, et cetera. And they uh, don't stop their slave trade, which they could have done in 1654 after Brazil came to an end. They decide now to start selling their human commodities uh, to foreign destinations, the French islands are soon enough also to uh, the Spanish. Thank you so much for that. Um, on trade again, can you, well not trade, but the Dutch West India Company, can you give us the relationship between the islands you focused on at the Dutch West India Company? Because it's, um, do I still have you? I don't know. Yeah. Ah, I think, yes, yes. I think you froze up. Okay, so can you give us the relationship between the Dutch West India Company and these islands? Because it's so, sometimes it's, confused. Um, the Dutch West India Company had a, a, a vested stake in these islands. And how is that different from actual the, um, the, the leadership in the Netherlands? How is the Dutch West India Company different from that? I will expand by that. Yeah. First of all, this goes back to the foundation of the West India Company in 1621. 1621 was the year that the war with Spain was resumed. There had been 12 years of truce and now the war was resumed. And the uh, Dutch authorities, the States General, and other high-ranking boards decided that uh, it was probably time to start an Atlantic front. That up until this point, they had been fighting in the Indian Ocean, in the Low Countries, but not in the Atlantic. So uh, in order for that to happen, they granted vast powers to the West India Company, just like they had done to the Dutch East India uh, Company, which meant that the West India Company could wage wars, could sign peace treaties. Uh, it could monopolize trade. It, uh, one of its other tasks was to move settlers to whatever Dutch colonies were going to be established. So it's a, it's a uh, company with many powers. Uh, what they do, between the 1620s and the 1640s is engage in massive warfare with uh, the Spanish and the Portuguese. And it's as part of that, I, meant, I, I called it the grand design that the Dutch also end up settling in the Caribbean. And there's a major battle fought, for instance, over St. Martin, uh, where the man who becomes the governor general of, of New Netherland, Peter Stuyvesant, loses his leg. Uh, so, the West India Company in the first decades is a war machine. Uh, commercially, it's not a success, which means that they have to open up the monopolies. They have to uh, grant private traders the rights to also uh, sell certain European commodities and buy certain American produce. Uh, and in terms of migration, it's not a success either. Then in 1674, the company goes bankrupt largely over what had happened in Brazil. You know, the long war in Brazil that eventually came to an end. And uh, when the company is refounded in the same year of 1674, it's a very different company. So it's a company that is involved in governance. So up until the end of the 18th century, the governors uh, are appointed by the West India Company. 
the West India Company has uh, a major say in how the islands are ruled, uh, in the trade of the islands. But the traders themselves often are no longer linked to the West India Company, which holds on to just a few monopolies, including the slave trade and uh, the African trade in, in uh, general. Uh, so up until 1791, when the West India Company, the second West India Company goes bankrupt, uh, it's the company that governs these islands. Okay, thank you. Um, another question, what inducements was there for a Dutch citizen to become a settler in the West Indies? Um, these, were these convicted criminals? Were these not convicted criminals? Yeah, so that's one interesting difference with uh, certainly the English. Uh, so you can say that virtually every person of African descent moving to Curaçao or St. Eustatia in the 17th century, and many of them in the 18th century are, of course, not free in the decision. They are forcibly taken on board ships. The white population, on the other hand, is never really forced to go. There are no convicted criminals. Sometimes you find debates in the archives about it. Should we empty up some of the jails? Um, that rarely happens. There are just a handful of cases available. Also, unlike the English and the French islands, where there are indentured servants and, and engagés, as they're called in the French islands, those don't exist in the Dutch colonies either. There are initiatives of the English and the French in a city like Amsterdam to recruit young, usually teenagers, uh, teenage boys, to work on the plantations in the 17th century. Um, so you have Dutch natives working in Barbados, working in Guadeloupe, but the Dutch themselves don't engage in this. Interesting because um, as you mentioned that comparison between the British and the Dutch systems, because we have um, you know, convicted criminals being Barbados, you know, uh, in the British system, which I always found to be something very interesting. And of course, the Australian situation as well. Um, okay, so are there any other questions for Professor Kuster before we close today? Okay. All right, um, just one last question. You, you focused on the other islands in the, the islands in the, the Dutch Caribbean, but um, I'm wondering if you have any information specifically on Tobago and the trade that occurred in the brief moments where, uh, where there were Dutch uh, enclaves on Tobago. Yes, uh, one thing that I find striking is that uh, so many of the inhabitants of Dutch Tobago are actually French. So we have a list of inhabitants and it's very clear that uh, perhaps even the most significant population group are, are the French. So there's something interesting going on in these years. You have a Dutchman coming out of Brazil, settling in Martinique, Guadeloupe. Uh, Dutchman settling in Cayenne, and then being chased out by the French. We have Frenchmen settling in Tobago, where then uh, a war erupts between the Dutch and the French. So there is warfare and there is coexistence. It's quite remarkable. Uh, you wonder what would have happened if the Dutch had held on to Tobago. Uh, one scenario would be that they had made it into uh, uh, their major sugar producer, at least in the West Indies. Uh, Suriname, of course, kept growing and growing and growing, and certainly wasn't only a sugar producer, but also a producer of cocoa and cotton and coffee. Uh, but there's one report, a contemporary report by a Dutch official who says, uh, Given our location, it will be very hard to maintain ourselves as a Dutch possession. So um, perhaps, you know, now it, it uh, was lost for the Dutch in the 1670s. Otherwise, it might have happened just 10 years later. That, I think, is what he, what he meant to say. Um, a question from Professor Barrett, and again, with the French folk in Tobago, Fibonacci, could you elaborate on that? Uh, 
That's a very good question. It's something I have to look into. I only have the names. And I just, uh, I just spent some time in Paris in the uh, National Archives, uh, where I was interested mostly in Martinique. I wasn't looking at, uh, at Tobago, but it would be hard to find these people because if they were Huguenots, how did they end up there? Uh, would they have been mentioned in, in, in French archives? Uh, we we'll probably have to follow the, uh, the post-Dutch history. And even then, it might not be easy because what happens in many uh, Caribbean colonies where the Huguenots do settle, they begin to assimilate little by little and become part of the larger population. But I would not be surprised because Huguenots did form a substantial segment of the French colonial population. But the answer is no, I, 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 really don't, I really don't know the answer. I'm just speculating. Perhaps some um, ground for further research on that. That would be interesting to know. Okay, um, thank you, Professor Kusa, for answering all these questions. And I will hand it over to Dr. Guy now. I hope she's here with us. Yes, good morning. I'm right here. Um, I would like to thank you to um, Professor Kluster for this very intriguing and enlightening program. Um, we would also like to thank the students from the high schools in Vlissinga who are participating in this program. Thank you very much to the National Historic Trust of Trinidad and Tobago. Again, to Ashley who has done a lot of service and his colleagues, Graham Sweet, Ty, and the others, I'd like to thank you. Also the chairman of the board and the CEO at the National Trust. I say thank you. Just a little preview of the um, next lecture. It's by Professor Aviva Benel, and she is a professor in Judaic and Near Eastern Studies at the University of Massachusetts at Amherst. And the title of her presentation would be The Exception That Proves the Rule Jews in the Dutch Caribbean. Thank you and have a lovely weekend. Would you like to say something else, Professor Kluster, before we go? Uh, well, I thank you very much for your attention and uh, thank you for you know, the invitation to speak here. Thank you so much for coming and everyone, we will see you on Friday. Thank you. Thanks again. <laughs>